protection uh, because it's a term which is used in a lot of international instruments and in, uh, bilateral nuclear cooperation agreements because it's been used for so long <coughs> and so we still use this term physical protection just for nuclear uh, material and facilities um, but it is very much part of the overall program which we call nuclear security uh, which also encompasses other radioactive material and uh, material out of regulatory control. Now whereas the majority of the IEA nuclear security program is um, relatively new and is not mature in the same way that uh, the safety standards is, um, in the nuclear area this has been going on for a very long time uh, back to 72 um, well it started in 1970 uh, producing the first uh, recommendations uh, on uh, physical protection and it's gone through a number of iterations since uh, been a number of revisions of this document um, like all IEA, um, certainly nuclear security documents, it's produced by representatives from member states um, and, uh, and then published by the agency. Um, so it's very much a product of the global community. Uh, it's not the IEA telling you what to do or suggesting what you should do. Um, it is... It is what the international community feels uh, should be done in this area. So, um, I had the uh, privilege of chairing uh, the group which developed the, the most recent revision, which was published in, I think, 2010. Um, it took several years to... Um, uh, formulate uh, an update and um, <coughs> interestingly it wasn't done as a result of 9-11 at all um, <laughs> what happened in 9-11 is we then got a raft of international uh, instruments um, put on the the books um, but this document was was fit for purpose even then because it had always been de developed initially <coughs> to protect nuclear material against theft uh, for use in a uh, nuclear explosive device uh, and laterally after Chernobyl giving more attention also to the sabotage of nuclear material and facilities like power plants. Um, and, uh, and so really it was fit, quite fit for purpose but as always things develop um, and uh, it's always good every 10 years or so to sit down and uh, say, you know, does this meet our current views on how to protect and what are the objections of, objectives of protection? Um, so actually what happened after 9-11 was you'll hear tomorrow about the Convention on Physical Protection being extended and so a lot of uh, effort was put into, by the same sort of people, into... Uh, um, producing an amendment to that convention and when that was finished then we were in a position to uh, revise the IEA recommendations because of course it's always been important that these are consistent with uh, international uh, instruments. And what went into the convention was um, some objectives and some fundamental principles which are similar but not identical to the essential elements which I uh, opened the um, meeting with earlier. So what we did was yeah, <coughs> ensure consistency with um, particularly this amendment to the convention. Uh, we introduced risk management. I mean we had all the bits in before but we didn't really explain why the threat is important, why we have a graded approach to consequences and why the rest of the document is about how to reduce the vulnerability to attack. 
um, which is really what risk management is all about. Uh, and so um, we introduced um, the concept of a risk management approach to protecting nuclear facilities, um, tying that in with a graded approach. Um, and that graded approach in, in turn is very much based on something we call defense in depth. In other words, the, uh, the higher the consequences of a target, the more uh, defense you put around it in, in concentric circles. Um, and um, that being in turn based on um, a graded approach, which is either I'll go into categorization systems um, and it also became important to, to note that we had a strong interface, not only with safety, um, but also with the nuclear material accountancy and control measures, which were starting to become very much orientated solely towards safeguards. And while safeguards is very important because um, all countries with a nuclear, certainly a nuclear program, are required under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to have a safeguards agreement with the IEA. Uh, these accountancy and control measures also strongly supported nuclear security. And it was important to remind the accountants and the material custodians that they were not just doing this to meet an international obligation. <coughs> so the scope is divided really in to the measures used um, uh, at facilities in use of storage and transport, because transport, the security measures you take obviously are very different than uh, the ones you would take to protect a fixed s installation. Um, and so we divide the book up in that in that way, um, and we look at protection against uh, the two objectives of unauthorized removal and sabotage. So let's start with the objectives. So first of all, we're protecting against unauthorized removal, and secondly, protecting against sabotage. Now, why only these two things? I'm sure you could come up with other reasons why it's very sensible to protect nuclear facilities. The reason is that because this is produced by an international agency, and it's focusing on what is concerned to the international community. In other words, what are the risks faced by any member state of the agency from operational nuclear facilities? Um, and of course, if material is removed without authority, and gets into the wrong hands, it can be moved to any other state and used to create some sort of problem. Um, and the same with sabotage, as we saw well from Chernobyl, um, cross-border implications can be quite significant. And neighboring countries, um, sometimes uh, thousands of kilometers away, uh, can be affected by um, a... Uh, meltdown of a, a, a nuclear power reactor. So this is really why it focuses these things on these, these two, two aspects. Um, in turn, it looks at what do you do at uh, recover, locating and recovering missing material, um, and to what extent does uh, security play a part in minimizing the effects of a successful sabotage attack. So having got these objectives, <coughs> we then produced, primarily for the purpose of this amendment to the convention, a number of fundamental principles. Um, and these are they, and we will go through them one by one. Talking about a nuclear facility, we're of course talking about anything which has um, uh, nuclear material. Um, although mining and milling is a bit outside um, the recommendations, um, it really once once it starts becoming natural uranium concentrated, then then it starts becoming 
the subject, certainly of these recommendations. Um, so through conversion, enrichment, fuel fabrication, into reactors, possibly reprocessed, if not long-term storage. Um, <coughs> all of these are various types of facilities which the recommendations have to cover. So they are not just specific to nuclear power stations, they also are applicable to other types of nuclear facilities. Um, physical protection regime is exactly the same as the nuclear security regime, three components. One, the legislative regulatory framework that the state puts in, the institutions and organisations within the state to which responsibilities are assigned, either administratively or by law, and then the physical protection systems put in place at the facilities or around to transport. Um, and it could equally be expressed this way, where the, the, the rate, much of the regime is, is up at the state competent authority level, um, but the license holders become responsible for producing a physical protection system, which in turn comprises an integrated set of measures, uh, and these measures uh, cover people, procedures, and equipment. And throughout all levels, we want to see nuclear security culture pervading. So, uh, who are the entities? Well, we've got the state. <coughs> In practical terms, that means the relevant ministries or departments of the state. Um, I think in most countries, the responsibility for national security resides with the, uh, the highest um, executive level, whether that's the president or the prime minister. Um, but in practice, of course, um, that's then delegated to various departments or ministries who will have responsibilities. Um, and they'll certainly include energy, um, interior, um, foreign office, um, etc. All have varying responsibilities. Um, and then, of course, down to the license holders, um, who are either the operators of the facilities or carriers, shippers, receivers for transport. Um, it gets a bit complicated in transport. Uh, they're all, transport is a very complex area, uh, partly because nuclear material is also dangerous goods and so we get involved with that but also because in some countries they decide the shipper and the person who actually produces the material is also responsible for its transport in others this is contracted out to other uh, professional carriers who, companies who, who actually do the transport um, and the receiver of it also plays a role by at least checking that it's arrived properly and reporting it so we looked at state responsibilities in broad terms um, first thing this morning <coughs> um, it's legal and regulatory framework it's got to assign responsibilities set requirements and this is an interesting area because there's now recognised two ways of doing this one is the prescriptive way, and the second is the um, performance-based way. So either the state writes a long list of things that have to be done, um, each individually described, um, and if you do all of them and something goes wrong, basically the state must take the, uh, the responsibility because it's decided what measures precisely will be in a nuclear facility for security. Uh, we're now moving more really to a more sensible way of saying actually what the state should do is set the objectives that it requires the operators to achieve in this area because we want an integrated, effective package of measures uh, in a physical protection system. And so 
and operators are always complaining that the government setting requirements and being too prescriptive and doesn't allow us freedom to do things our way. Okay, you do it your way, but this is what you've got to achieve, and you set objectives in terms of controlling access, in terms of detection, etc., etc. And um, you allow the operator to come up with a package of measures which achieve that. Um, this requires much more competence on the part of the operator because it's no longer ticking a box of what, what requirements have been set by the state in a detailed manner, um, but uh, he now got to work it out himself and justify it to the regulator to get a license. So I think we have enough about the state responsibility, and that's its job to establish, <coughs> implement, uh, or ensure implementation of, more, more like it, maintain, sustain a physical protection regime, effective against, and we say unauthorised removal because, of course, um, uh, what's more commonly called theft, um, but there are some ways of obtaining material by fraud, for instance, which clearly is unauthorised removal, um, but some countries call that by a different name than theft, so that's why we use this word unauthorised removal. So it means obtaining material by whatever means, whether it means physically picking it up, whether it's by deception, by whatever means, um, that's unauthorised removal. Um, and sabotage, um, of course, is causing an unacceptable radiological release deliberately. Um, we've had some interesting questions about threat up, threats and things like that. Um, it's clearly a state responsibility to define this. The threat is not static and the state is responsible for monitoring it and advising people of changes to it. Um, also of course, the state's legal regulatory infrastructure is written to cater for what, what is in the state. Um, some states at the moment only have research reactors, uh, for instance, but if they look at their regime, they might find that the laws and regulations are inadequate to deal with the construction of a nuclear power plant, for instance. So when you introduce new types of material, new facilities, uh, you need to look at what you've got in place and refine it accordingly. <coughs> and then, of course, the state plays a lot of responsibilities in terms of uh, uh, if material's lost or the sabotage, etc. Uh, the book talks about competent authorities in, in a way that any state body that's got a responsibility, like the police responding to a an attack are a competent authority. Um, but more generally, what we're talking about a competent authority here, we're talking about a regulatory body uh, which is designated by the state. Uh, invariably, you need a law to do this um, because it's got to have legal authority <coughs> and that means authority to enter your premises at any time and inspect whatever it likes. Um, and that needs legal powers to do. Um, clearly it has to be competent um, because it's regulating some very competent people who are running a power reactor. Um, it needs money to be able to carry out its duties um, and obviously human resources. Um, and its job is to exercise, uh, to issue authorizations and exercise oversight over what we call applicants. There are people who've applied for a license uh, but n don't yet have a facility. Operators, which is a generic term for anyone who operates a facility, uh, and shippers and carriers, depending on who's responsible for transport. Um, Certainly the regulatory body will need to have access to the state system of nuclear material counseling and control. Uh, I mentioned a very important, you know, at a facility for there to be a strong interface uh, with the nuclear material counseling and control people. Uh, but of course at the state level, um, uh, 
the regulator will want to go to whoever's running the state system of nuclear material accounts in control to find out where the material is um, and uh, therefore um, uh, w which places should have a license uh, to operate and own this material. Um, and the competent authorities have got a big keen role in making sure that, that evaluations are carried out regularly um, to ensure that all the systems installed are sustained and all the contingency plans are regularly exercised. And many of these things will then re reveal how impro necessary improvements <coughs> and um, course it's up to the regulatory body then to make sure that these corrective actions are taken whether they're amending the contingency plan as a result of lessons learned from an exercise or ensuring that cameras are replaced because they are now not good enough to carry out evaluation and you, you need some new ones but the main thing about it is is the operator is always in the lead in this area because they're going to be the first person to know they've got a problem. They're going to be the first people who detect someone climbing over the fence. They're going to be the first person to discover something might be missing. Um, the regulator sits there oblivious of all this, hoping that his regulations are being um, adhered to. Um, so it is absolutely important that the regulator is informed as soon as possible of any nuclear security event, any untoward activity, um, so that it is in the picture as much as the operator is. Um, and most countries will be encouraged to have uh, regulations which require reporting of certain events uh, in a timely manner. Um, and then the operators need to ensure through their management system that these things are reported to the appropriate people in management uh, and reported onward and upwards. Um, uh, so, if necessary, to the police or whatever, as well as to the regulatory body. Threat assessment. Um, well, we've had this. The state defines the threat assessment and associated, um, associated capabilities. Um, and then a DB design basis threat is developed. As a design basis threat is really the worst case that you could get. Um, it's really, it's, it's looking at what is the, the, we may have attacks, they may only be committed by one insider um, whose capability is fairly limited. Um, but what's the worst case we could have? Um, uh, the insider not only uh, working by himself, but also in conjunction with, a, uh, with an external attacker force, etc., of X number of people who have X number of guns um, and access to explosives, etc. Um, and um, in what we call high-consequence high targets like nuclear power stations, where clearly the consequences of a sabotage attack can be very, very serious, uh, for that we require design basis threat as uh, or we recommend it anyway, uh, as we do for holders of Category 1 nuclear material, which I'll come on to. But for lesser facilities like a uh, you know, fuel fabrication facility just dealing with low enriched uranium, uh, you wouldn't necessarily require a design basis threat because under the graded approach you wouldn't need as much security on a fuel fabrication facility as you would on a nuclear power station. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the design. So where security is especially important, such as a nuclear power station, um, then it's the basis for the physical protection system design. Um, so the operator or designer needs to sit down, look at this design basis threat, and work out how exactly they're going to protect the plant against the capability described in that uh, document. And that also, of course, means looking at insiders as well. <coughs> Risk management, I mentioned that before. Um, 
<coughs> it's up to the state, really, to set its risk appetite. Um, risk management doesn't mean we're completely removing the risk. Um, to do that would probably require, well, the only safe way would be to shut down the nuclear power station. That would remove the risk pretty much. <laughs> but if you're going to operate it, then there will always be some residual risk, um, at least there's something minor happening. And uh, it's up to the state to determine what, what its risk appetite is. Um, in this context, they used to always get very excited in the UK every time someone climbed over the perimeter fence of a facility. <coughs> we had to explain to the minister that you'll see this from time to time. This is not a, a, uh, a threat um, which is going to produce any consequences because immediately he climbs over, we detect him and he's arrested. He's got nowhere near a target, therefore there was no risk. Um, but perception-wise, they get very, they, they see it as a security breach and, and uh, it should be prevented from happening in future, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, people's idea of perception and risk can vary quite considerably. Uh, uh, ministers um, tend to want to see no risk at all <laughs> and then you tell them what the cost of not having any risk and they then decide that perhaps they'll have to live with a little bit of risk so what can, what can we do about risk well reducing the threat really is a straight responsibility I mean, if there's a group of terrorists in the country it's up to the law enforcement and intelligence bodies to um, deal with these people as best they can and try and reduce that threat. The operator can't do very much about it, but the operator can do something, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, deterring people attacking it by making it look a very hard target and hope that the bad guys will go and attack soft targets, which is why, in the moment in Europe, we're getting so many of these attacks on public places, um, because these countries all have nuclear power stations, but um, they're pretty well protected, whereas the uh, streets of the capital um, are invariably not so well protected. Um, we can improve the effectiveness of the physical protection system, so that's going to cost money, though, um, in both in manpower and in physical equipment. <coughs> and, of course, be in danger of reducing operational efficiency. So, um, but certainly we're going to need to reduce the vulnerability in some way or other. Um, but also what is not looked at so much is reducing potential consequences. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you can do this. Um, uh, for instance, if you've got liquid radioactive waste, um, uh, it's very easy to you know, disperse around, especially if you're on a hill. Um, but why not uh, sol sol solidify that with by you know, mixing it in with some, uh, what we do with high, high active is, is vitrify it with gl glass and turn it into glass blocks. You've still got the radiation levels, but it's not dispersible in the same way. Uh, if you put a bomb against a glass block, it just blows the block around. Um, Whereas uh, if you, you know, um, put a bomb in and disperse the liquid, then you'd have a lot more of a, a problem of cleanup. Um, so there are ways of doing, doing, doing this, um, where modifying the um, uh, material. One of the other things that's been done a lot in the last <coughs> 15 years is converting research reactors from operating on high rich uranium, a material uh, especially useful for making nuclear weapons, um, making and turning them into into running on low enriched uranium, um, because the that low enriched uranium would require further conversion to be able to be suitable for uh, nuclear explosive devices. So, um, by reducing the enrichment that, that the research reactors use, we've reduced the risk quite considerably and. That has benefits in terms of um, uh, not only um, minimising the likelihood of uh, uh, terrorists getting hold of high-rich uranium, but also reducing the need for the amount of security on the research reactors uh, because they're no longer such an attractive target.
So I mentioned gradient approach. What, what exactly is this? Is this is, um, I mean, if you said it in sort of money terms, I mean, a, a shop holding, I don't know, uh, a few thousand pounds, dollars of stock or something, um, is going to have some security on it, but not the same as a bank with millions of dollars, pounds, euros, or whatever in it. Um, and it's the same, really, with nuclear material. Um, we look at what the consequences of its theft or dispersal are, and then work out how much security is required. So in terms of um, theft, many, many years ago, uh, in fact, about 1975, I think, they finalised this table, of, uh, and they placed nuclear material into categories. <coughs> Category one, containing the most attractive material, suitable for nuclear explosive devices, and category three being lesser material, which would need a um, either multiple thefts of plutonium or HEU to get enough material, or um, a lot of extra processing to convert low enriched material to high enriched. Um, so, um, and then there are a set of measures um, increasing what the book does is say these are the things you do for category three, but if you've got category two, here's the extra things you do, and if you've got two kilograms or more of plutonium, then you do all these other extra things. So there's a sort of graded approach to security, amount uh, you reduce vulnerability to theft. And of course, at the top end, you really want to reduce it as far as possible, uh, the risk of uh, successful theft. Now, with sabotage, it's not quite as easy to do the same thing um, because um, it's the radiation level of the material here, which is the key thing. And you could get some of the same radiation levels from radioactive material, if in bulk, like cobalt-60, as you could from irradiated nuclear fuel. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, some things have different properties in terms of if they're ingested, um, then they can kill you, um, whereas other things um, are not pose the same risk. So it's very complicated. Anyway. Uh, what we suggested countries do is they set what they call a level of unacceptable radiological consequences. And I think what we had in mind here was if the consequences of a sabotage of a facility is going to affect the local population outside the perimeter to some extent, then normally you have to invoke then a, a district emergency plan you then have to be thinking about evacuating people etc and clearly most people would, in government would think that's pretty unacceptable that you um, you've got a hazard which uh, um, impinges on the local population and then um, above that would be what we call high radiological consequences and here we're talking about things that would have a major impact potentially even cross-border. Um, and this is all worked out on, on um, exposures, basically, to um, people. Um, and uh, the good safety folks can calculate the impact of you know, dispersal of this amount of this material would result in uh, this amount of um, radiological consequences at this point. So it, it requires quite a, quite a lot of work to, um, uh, it's easy to set a level, but to work out exactly whether you've got the material which would meet that material uh, level um, is quite a bit of, uh, of work to do. But it's the only sensible way we can come around um, to coming to a graded approach on sabotage. Um, defense in depth. Um, so the higher the consequences, the more defense in depth you want. So here is a sort of classic little thing of I've got to climb over the perimeter fence from off-site. Uh, 
I'm then in a limited access area where I could be detected um, by patrolling guards, etc. Um, then I come to another fence which is surrounds what's called the protected area, <coughs> um, which has got detection devices and cameras on it. And certainly if I try and get over or through that, I'm almost certainly going to be detected. Um, and then I've still got to get into this control building, um, which is housing the Category 2 or Category 1 nuclear material or, or um, uh, is a vital area from a sabotage point of view. Um, and having got into the control building, then I've probably still got to get through further barriers to get to the actual target itself, which will be in a locked room or a strong room or something like that. So all through uh, these various things, the more you put these in, each of them should have detection, assessment and um, delay and delay something because the earlier you don't start responding to an attack until you've had a detection and assessed that it actually is caused by a human being and not by uh, an animal or something like that. So this is the concept of defence in depth and we, uh, we use it a lot in terms of devising recommended measures for uh, a graded approach. But some things are common regardless of what the consequences are. <coughs> um, you'll always require contingency plans. Um, and they've all got to um, work in with the emergency plan, which is the safety response, for, for which includes reaction to sabotage tanks. Um, Contingency plans are diff slightly different. Emergency plans triggered by an actual release, but many of the contingency plans are triggered by a detection of something which should not be happening, like a person climbing over a fence. Um, and, um, and then there is a response to prevent that person or persons getting to the target area um, and either removing it or damaging it. Security culture, we've mentioned at some length now, um, that's important. Quality assurance was um, identified as one of the fundamental principles um, by the people back in about 2000 who were doing the work on amending the convention. Um, that <coughs> is now commonly referred to as quality management and it's part of integrated management, but for the purposes of um, uh, certainly the convention anyway and, and the book we still talk about is quality assurance but it's making sure that, that things are um, constructed etc as they should be as they're designed to be um, confidentiality this is another name for protecting sensitive information um, although it now merges a bit into uh, the cyber security program and not only protecting information and communication systems but also protecting instrument and control systems and finally we've got the sustainability program to keep the whole thing running um, throughout uh, its lifetime so what responsibilities have operators got um, well, first of all, obviously, they've got to comply with the law and regulations, uh, which sounds quite simple, but uh, if the regulations get too detailed, then, then they, you, they hit problems and want um, to put up alternative uh, means and stuff like that. So uh, complying with regulations may not be quite so simple as it looks on paper. Um, They've got to cooperate and coordinate their own activities with other state bodies with responsibilities, and these include not only the state people who are going to um, make sure that their safeguards compliant, etc., but also, of course, with people like the response force who are going to come from outside, because it's no good the police turning up at the front gate and never having been in the in this complex of a power reactor or two power reactors and knowing exactly where they, they're supposed to go and where there are dangers, etc., etc. Um, 
and the radiation protection requirements, etc. So um, there is a need for, to cl work very closely with these sort of state bodies. Um, nuclear material cancer and control me mentioned already. <coughs> What we now recommend is that in order to get a license um, or an approval uh, from the point of view of new, uh, physical protection, uh, the operator should submit a security plan, which is a detailed description of what measures they've actually got in place in the facility to protect against theft and sabotage, um, and uh, the contingency plans that they have in place to deal with nuclear security events um, of one kind or another. And um, the regulator then either approves this plan and makes a condition that it be implemented from now on. So it's not just a plan, and then when it once is approved, it becomes in itself a regulatory requirement to do exactly what it says in there, which is a lot easier than having lots of very complex regulations saying exactly what you do. Um, and, um, or otherwise, there will be discussions backwards and forwards of how the plan needs to be improved in order for the regulator to approve it. Um, but eventually, the, the, long, the ultimate thing is to have an approved security plan. Uh, optimum site selection and design. Site selection often is an area I think government gets more involved in, um, certainly because it, it, it goes in with planning requirements, things like that. But design is very much um, something uh, between the operator and the designer or the vendor. Um, but it's up to them to make sure that the uh, um, design incorporates the sort of phys uh, physical protection measures that will be required. <coughs> um, yeah, and then having set all this up, then the operator is responsible for evaluating the system on a regular basis, making sure it does work, uh, going around kicking the fence, making sure the alarms go off, for instance, to full-scale exercises with response forces, uh, to ensure that um, they uh, protect the target um, and prevent the bad guys getting to, getting to it. They're also responsible for compensatory measures. I mentioned about them reporting things to regulatory bodies. It's very important that they also re report any failures in this physical protection system, um, however they're caused. Um, you know, if the fence blows down in high wind, which you once had somewhere, um, then obviously he needs to put some guards there until the fence has been repaired. Um, because the, the delay factor and detection uh, provided by that fence is no longer there. Um, similarly, if other equipment breaks or something like that and, and pending repair, then the operator is got to tell the regulator that it's not running as per the approved security plan and what measures that have been put in place to compensate for this on the short term until the repair is undertaken. Um, and if it's a more important work necessary, um, he'll then have to get, which uh, involves a uh, <coughs> amendment to the security plan, then he's obviously going to have to get that cleared in advance. Uh, because there should be no change to the security plan unless the regulator has approved it in advance. So this is very much a sort of system of how the regulator um, maintains oversight um, and uh, ensures that the um, what's in place has always been approved by it um, as part of the security plan. Um, we were asked about detection, to delay, and response earlier on. Um, the system is an integrated set of measures intended to prevent completion of a malicious act, whether that is theft or sabotage. 
Um, and one of the ways of looking at this is, is doing a timeline of where am I going to detect them, how much delay is provided between there and the target, and will the response force get there in order to prevent them attacking the target, whether it's material or equipment, systems or devices important to safety. Um, and so, as illustrated here, um, uh, you look at it from the point of view of the tasks that the external attacker has to do, um, and you can then time how long you would expect them to take to do it. Um, and uh, and that could extend to things like them if they need to blow a hole in a wall um, uh, how long would it take them to set up a charge to blow a hole in the wall of the building in order to get through the build into the building etc um, these are all tasks that you know they would be faced with and they all these tasks would take time um, and then you look at uh, through exercises at the time the response force takes to get um, to an appropriate place to interrupt the attack uh, by getting between the bad guys and the target and then what's called neutralizing them which is arresting or killing them I suppose so here we look at it in the thing um, the functions that you're, you're will be having at a, a nuclear power station would be you would have a detection preferably as far out as possible from the the actual um, power um, block um, and there you would hope that the sensor or multiple sensors often you often put on fences two types of sensors so that if one doesn't work the other will do that will then send an alarm signal to what we call a central alarm station. Um, and there they will assess what caused the alarm through looking at camera footage of the area. And until they've done this assessment, there is no detection. So from this timeline point of view, the, the, that, that time doesn't take account until you've got this uh, assessment so in other words you need to be able to assess what caused an alarm very quickly because you're now racing against the attack in order to uh, to buy more time you can provide delay obstacles so walls and things like that hardened doors to get into buildings all these sort of things are delay features um, which uh, the attacker has to get through um, and meanwhile, the central alarm station is communicating to the response force what has happened. The response force deploys and then interrupts and neutralizes the adversary attempt. At least in, in that's the overall plan anyway. Uh, in practice, I guess, unless you've got a response force on your facility already, you're... Uh, you're unlikely to buy the amount of time you need, not without putting tremendously amount of money into delay barriers, um, because uh, any um, delay barriers, obstacles can be defeated just given enough time. Uh, we've seen uh, people, um, criminals attack uh, bank vaults or safe deposit vaults uh, by drilling their way through walls and things like that you know uh, unless the alarm's gone off and the response is on its way you know give, they've given them time they'll get they'll get into the bank vault and they'll rob it uh, it's the same with any 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 delay things you put up uh, you're only buying time you're not preventing uh, anything at all so these layers we have, um, and we end up with more security on all of them as they get close to the target. So we have the limited access area where <coughs> access is limited and controlled. Um, in other words, this is where your first gate will be, or where your first fence will be, uh, where the first access control checks will be carried out. For the more important targets, they'll be in a protected area. So we'll have a repeat of the whole thing again with fences, cameras, 
uh, access control, search, all that sort of thing, um, until you get to an inner area or a vital area, and these are the top targets, either Category 1 nuclear material or vital area, which is uh, an area containing equipment systems or devices or nuclear material, which could lead to high radiological consequences. So and one of the things that a nuclear power plant is go and identify what those are um, and decide how you're going to protect them. I mean, a classic is standby diesel generators. Yeah. Um, I mean, the problem with Fukushima was the lack of standby power. Uh, they lost not only the main supply, but the power, the, the backup. Um, and as a result, you know, there was, there was a really serious problem. Um, but you know, if you've got six standby diesel generators, it doesn't seem to, seem to mean that we need to protect each and every single one of them, because how many do you actually need to maintain standby power? If it's only two at a time, then select two of them and make sure that they're really well protected. Um, and, uh, you know, so there are ways of, of working out uh, what systems could be attacked and what redundancy is in place from a safety point of view uh, and, and work out uh, what's the minimum number of um, um, features that would need to be attacked to cause a high radiological consequence release. Um, so schematically it looks like that um, with... Um, various barriers at uh, fences and detection each into each area. And um, here you can see that, that for Category 1, Category 3 material, um, we're quite happy that that's just in a building inside a fence with a perimeter around it. Uh, because for Category 3, we're talking about stuff like low enriched rich uranium fresh fuel, which actually <coughs> you can't do a lot with immediately. Uh, it's low enriched. Um, it's not very radioactive at all. Um, certainly, it's not going to cause by itself high radiological consequences. Um, but when you irradiate that fuel and take it out the reactor and put it in a pond, it then becomes Category 2 material and then it's in a protected area. So then it's getting yet another layer of, of protection around it. And if it was assessed that you could, I don't know, say drain the pot, remove the water, and uh, you'd certainly be into high radiological consequences, and that pond would then be a vital area. Um, so then you'd have, you know, uh, at least three levels of uh, protection around that pond. So that's the way a graded approach and defense in depth work tandem in tandem. So, um, that really is sort of a quick run through about the sort of measures that, that re require to be taken both by the state and uh, the operators to protect against um, unauthorized removal and sabotage of something like a nuclear power station. Um, <coughs> the agency's got quite a large program now um, of a range of activities to help member states um, in this area. Um, one, I mentioned um, documents like um, the Objectives and Fundamental Principles um, and this one I've just been talking about which is um, the Physical Protection one. Um, but there are 26 documents I think currently being published um, and many more on their way. And um, they're in a hierarchy. We've done the fundamentals and recommendations. Most of the implementing guides have now been done, and um, we're now working on a lot of technical guidance um, of how to uh, do things in particular areas, such as um, a handbook on physical protection, equipment, and things like that, which is very, very detailed, or um, how to um, plan contingency plans and exercise and things like that uh, on you know, particular areas uh, of interest. Um, and the way this is done is, is the, the fundamentals say what should, there are the essential elements for a state. The recommendations like this book are basically largely what should be done 
Um, and then the implementing technical guidance uh, contains suggestions of how you might achieve the what in the recommendations. But at the end of the day, it's all guidance. None of this is legally binding by itself. So, as I said before, they're developed by member states' experts. Um, there is now a Nuclear Security Guidance Committee, which then looks at the product and makes sure that things like consistency are in place. Um, and um, makes any corrections it finds necessary. But again, that committee is formed by representatives from member states. Um, and then it goes into publication to make sure it complies with the publication standards of the agency. <coughs> um, every couple of years or so, and every, you know, I think it's four years, they have a nuclear security plan this is approved by the Board of Governors um, and basically says what the agency can offer uh, during the next four years and what its priorities will be to, to various things, whether needs assess assessment, uh, coordination, research projects, etc. Um, so we look a bit more assistance to cooperation. Um, a lot of work being put in done into encouraging um, people to adhere to relevant legal instruments. Um, of course, they develop the nuclear security guidance documents. And these documents then form the basis for advisory service visits, missions to countries on request. Um, and so they're uh, physical protection regimes are then assessed against the IEA recommendations. Um, but again, it's voluntary, it's on request, and the advice received is not legally binding. A um, lot of work being put into education and training, what's known as capacity building, um, especially for newcomer states who are embarking on nuclear power. Um, there are a whole range of people who will now be, need to be trained up on all sorts of areas which never previously uh, existed in a country. Uh, a lot of work done on major public events this is in terms of advising how to protect against them being attacked with a dirty bomb, uh, which is always considered a sort of major threat. Um, you've got 80,000 people in one small area and, and you let off a dispersal device, one could imagine um, not only the potential health consequences, but the panic um, which would ensue. And risk reduction, which is uh, um, often bringing donor countries together with recipients to um, improve their uh, physical protection equipment, etc. Um, there are two sets of advisory services. One deals with material ad register control, so that's looking at advising customs, border authorities, people like that, state um, police forces. Um, and this other one, which is the Physical Protection Advisory Service, which goes and looks at um, the state regime, um, not only for nuclear, but also now it has a module for, ra for states just with ra uh, for radioactive material. And it looks then at the regime in place for protecting radioactive sources and looks at some places where they're held to look at the level of um, uh, security measures in place. <coughs> and so far, there have been quite a lot of these advisory missions. They're quite popular. Um, and certainly, if you're embarking on nuclear power program, um, as part of commissioning the place at the end of the day, having an advisory mission, external advice like this would be very useful to make sure that what you put in place um, is good. It's all voluntary. It's recognized as a very sensitive area and the report produced is highly confidential, which is a top sort of classification of the IA thing. Um, and it only goes to the state who invited it. 
it's never distributed anywhere else and um, it's then up to the state concerned to um, decide to implement all the recommendations and suggestions in it, which normally they do because there's not much point having this sort of advice if you don't then follow up on it. Education, training, a lot of work done with um, universities and that sort of things to roll out. Um, again, sort of security is, uh, I, if I went back 20 years ago, you'd find very few universities had courses on anything to do with security in any realm, of, uh, even commercial security. Um, this, this is now recognized as a sort of important area. <coughs> um, by, by many universities are now increasingly getting courses with masters in uh, security, not only commercial security, but even nuclear security. And then of course there's training courses, um, numerous ones, those are provided by the IEA. Um, although the accent really is on train the trainer. Um, if we can get some people trained in a particular country in, in, in this, then they can then roll out that same training to more people within their country. Um, and to this end, countries are now encouraged to have uh, nuclear security support centres, um, otherwise known as centres of excellence by some, um, where they carry out their own national training um, and um, the IEA supports this, uh, partly by getting all these support centres together to discuss their experience and share best practice, etc. So there's a lot of work going in on in this area to uh, improve capacity building. Um, and as a ed security education network, it's exactly the same with sharing um, uh, course material and things like that. Major public events. Um, this is these are some of the sort of things that the uh, IEA has provided support to in terms of training up access control to include detection of radioactive material, attempts to be smuggling those into stadiums, etc. Risk reduction, a lot of upgrades done, especially in the radioactive source area, um, and a lot of in. In detection instruments being provided. Um, this is all collected together often in an integrated nuclear security support plan for a country and so it's all all their needs are captured on one plan. Um, again all this is totally voluntary. E-learning is now a new thing coming in a lot, a lot of. Um, so uh, you can go onto the IA website and download e-learning packages. Um, I think I've mentioned most of those things. Research reactor programs, a lot of work being got done on them to um, enhance and sustain their nuclear security. Um, accountancy and control, <coughs> a lot of work being done in that area in the last few years. Um, uh, getting across, and there is a book now on it, use. Um, it's nuclear material and accounts in control for nuclear security, in other words, making it clear what part of their work contributes to nuclear security. Um, that's what nuclear material does. Not on radio transport as well. Um, there is a lot of transport taking place, but a number of transporters actually are fairly limited. Um, so it's often the supply countries that actually <coughs> arrange the transport using transport means they've got. So that really concludes the nuclear security part of this course. Um, so if you want more questions. Uh, function is uh, how uh, the films to 
save God. Mm. Uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes in some countries, this uh, well, some big countries, some big different to save God. Security is different from the security. So how do you think that would be? Um, yeah, we like it to be different. Uh, we 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 don't. Uh, we don't really want to put the security man in charge of counting the material, um, because if he himself was an insider and wanted to steal the material, he could cover it up. So it's far better to have a separate lot of body of people here counting the material, making sure it's there, than the security people over here who would only um, uh, follow up any reports of material being missing. So uh, it's always a good idea to separate it at a facility level. Um, at a state level, um, there is something called a state system of accounting and control, which is, which is there to ensure accurate reports are given to the IEA safeguards division, uh, division department, I mean, um, who then you know, have the accounts of the world, if you like. Uh, and they're the people who send out inspectors of their own to check that uh, material is um, where it's supposed to be. Um, so up there, it's it's not quite so important. But at, but at a facility level, it's very important to have the accountants separate. The control bit is done by what we call nuclear material custodians. So they're the people actually in charge of the building where the material is. And they're the people really um, who control access to the building, control movement within the building, and submit reports to the accountants on material being moved in and out of the building. So the accountants maintain a, an up-to-date record of where material is or where it's gone. Uh, and then they report up to the state, um, and then the state reports to the IEA. So that's how it works. But best to be separated. Yeah. Yes? How does the international work because the states have to exposure their weakness when they are asking for help to improve their security. Mm. So how, how does it work? Is it easy to expose and to receive the help? Uh, yeah, so the question is how does a state get help from the IEA? Um, well, it's very easy. Um, <laughs> you just... There is a division of nuclear security uh, at the IEA. If you go onto the IEA website, um, it'll, you go on uh, what we do, and you'll then get onto a web page to do with nuclear security. And there you will find contact telephone numbers and email addresses um, of the various section leaders who uh, are responsible for various things. and. Uh, you just get in touch with them um, and and ask for assistance. So it's it's quite quite a simple thing to do. Um, of course, I'm, I wouldn't guarantee that always they're capable of giving. I mean, obviously, um, they were running to a budget. They don't have unlimited resources, uh, especially if, if you wanted help in upgrading a physical protection system and things. But um, Certainly, they will do whatever they can do and suggest how, how they can best help you. But, I mean, when the country needs help, mm. because it has a weakness yeah. in the security program. Yeah. So, is, is it asking for help because this is exposure the, the weakness in the security program? <coughs> you said before that it, it's very, you have to first solve it and then you show well, I mean, if it identifies an area it's weak in, yeah, I mean, it can get in touch with the IA and ask for uh, advice on uh, um, addressing that. Um, I mean, one way is having an advisory service mission like IPAS to come along and give advice on how to improve it, bearing in mind that often... There are things that have to be done at the state level and also by the operator, so there are more than one party often involved in these problems. Um, it may be uh, a need for improved human capacity, um, better nuclear security culture, something like that, in which case, uh, you know, there are training courses and things like that. Um, the big 
difficult area is is if you wanted money to you know build a new fence or something and provide lots of cameras that's when that's when it gets problems because they don't really have uh, they have some money to supply things like detection instruments for major public events and stuff like that but uh, um, building the, all the detection delay systems around nuclear power reactor is quite quite costly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, in one of the slides that you discussed today, uh, one way to reduce the potential consequences is to ask the physics reactor to convert to the lower uranium uh, level. Now, we, last week we discussed in the new development of a fast breeder reactor mm -hmm. that required higher uh, concentration of uranium. Is there any effort that has been done to, with respect to the nuclear security in response to that demand? What, the security of a fast breeder reactor? Yes, because <coughs> Well, fast breed reactors, um, I mean, one of, your, one of your first issues is that the fresh fuel is normally about 30% plutonium or high enriched uranium. So straight away you're into category one nuclear material which needs protecting against theft. So that incre increases the, the security you need around the fresh fuel. So that's, that's the big issue. Um, otherwise... Um, yeah, I mean, the consequences of, of sabotage are not dissimilar, I would say, to... Uh, I mean, you've got a different primary cooling circuits. You've probably got something... I mean, the one we had in the UK had, had sodium uh, rather than water-cooled um, primary cooling circuit, but that gets react radioactive. But, I mean, it's still, you know, something that you could sabotage. I don't think it makes that much difference whether it's water running around or liquid sodium. <laughs> um, but the main problem, I think, is the fresh fuel. That's that's the area where, you know, from a security perspective. So from the security perspective, will have to change any concerns? Um, Compared to the other type of reactor. Well, uh, <laughs> I think I think the the world would be happier if plutonium and high enriched uranium did not exist in the civil sector. <laughs> so there's that side to it, um, uh, which is why they did so much work at uh, re getting uh, research reactors to reduce the enrichment of their fuel. Um, so there is an issue there. You know, the, um, it's, a, it's the fresh fuel thing. And then how are you going to get this you know, fresh fuel? If you then... You probably need to re reprocess it. And I mean, the, the whole purpose of fast breeders is they breed more plutonium or whatever. Well, then you need a reprocessing plant to then extract that plutonium from the depleted uranium or whatever you've used as the breeder fuel. So you're, you're into a lot of complex fuel cycle issues here with fast breeders. Um, whereas with um, most other power reactors these days, most people are... Uh, just having a once through fuel cycle and then uh, looking for ways of disposing of their spent fuel underground somewhere. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, yeah, the question was, what if radioactive material got, got in the sea in one country and then um, affected another country? Um, well, the sea is a great diluter. <laughs> it's rather like the atmosphere. Um, uh, there is plenty, yeah, there's been material in, uh, nuclear material in the oceans for some, some years now. It's, sunken uh, nuclear-powered submarines spring to mind. <laughs> there used to be, actually, what it was seen as a disposal means many, many years ago. Um, 
Yeah, I think the, the real problem with um, getting in there is, is getting into the food chain. Um, that's, that's more the problem um, for neighbouring countries, yeah, which is why there is no, you know, um, you're not allowed to discharge radioactive material into the seas, etc. You shouldn't, what well, you shouldn't do anyway. Um, but if you, if you do, well, I don't know, this becomes something like a, uh, a matter between the countries concerned. They would take it up under some some conventions or other, uh, but it's not really a nuclear security issue because it would be so diluted that it wouldn't be a, a security issue, it wouldn't be discrete material anymore. Unless you dug it out. Yes? Hi. Hmm. How did it come in? Um, well, I don't know. I'm not a nuclear weapons scientist. <laughs> uh, I guess that somehow they decided that um, below nu below 20%, uh, one would have to do uh, a lot of extra reprocessing, uh, a lot of extra enrichment to um, make the material useful for, for a weapon. Um, I guess it's pretty arbitrary. Um, I think the, the, the levels are pretty arbitrary um, and the, the, the weights are because probably 1% either way wouldn't make much difference. Um, equally, you know, we say 2 kilograms of plutonium is category 1. What happens if it's 1.99? I mean, it's, 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 you've just got to draw a line somewhere and they're, and they're fairly rough, I think, you know, lines... Uh, to, to produce a graded approach. Um, so that probably is the answer, is, is that <laughs> I wouldn't get too fixated about it. Um, it's why um, all the research reactors are running on, uh, these days, on 19.75% enriched, because <laughs> they know if they get any further above that, they get into additional security problems. Um, but it, in practice, those, those problems are probably pretty arbitrary and it wouldn't make much difference if you end up another one percent substantially but there we are yeah and uh, from your experience what are the best methods to let's say bridge between communication gaps that usually exist in uh, organizations that are involved in nuclear security because some of the organizations best coordination what are the best coordination measures a committee. <laughs> no, you need, yeah, I mean, one of the best, well, I'm going to go two ways. One is to organize regular meetings of these bodies, uh, get the people all around the same table from time to time is a, is a very useful way of doing it. Uh, exercises are another useful way um, because that eventually, that gets everyone thinking about the same problem for for a time, um, and there are, there are various ways. But again, it's very important, that, you know, like all leadership, it comes from the top. Um, it's very important that, 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 you know, the higher reaches of government make clear that this is an important issue, and they expect the people they've given responsibilities to to interact with one another and, and make sure there are no problems um, at responding or whatever else they're, they're engaged in doing. Um, yeah, I'm conscious, of course, I'm eating into your lunch time now. <laughs> I just wanted to ask whether the nuclear security regime here is also consulting with the Orban countries. Since they're not by definition in the regulatory <coughs> control, but they're both targets to the green violence in the Yeah, questions about orphan sources. Um, yeah, when I've been talking about material out of regulatory control, what I'm talking about includes orphan sources. That was a, a name which was um, used a lot in, in, in more commonly in the safety area um, about orphan sources because there's a big problem where a lot have become orphaned. They haven't been necessarily stolen. Um, they've sometimes been liking you know, companies which went bankrupt and abandoned their building and left behind the source that was inside and government didn't know it was there and blah, 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 blah. And next minute it's in the scrap metal chain. 
Um, yeah, so, that, so, so but from a security point of view, the IEA came up with this term, out of regulatory control. So it meant often for whatever reason, whether, whether it was stolen, whether it accidentally became orphan, in, it was a term of it hasn't got any parents to look after it. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but so whenever I mention material out of regulatory control, and, and, and a third of this nuclear security program, the IA deals with that topic, then, yeah, that includes orphan sources. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, I've, uh, we've got a question, we've got a room, any other questions about uh, half past five tonight, haven't we? We have a wrap-up uh, session for the day, which I'll be present at, so... Um, so if you've got any more questions, I suggest you perhaps leave it till mm. half five and um, let me have them then. <laughs> the one <laughs> Yeah, the quick one. My question is, Yuri carried out uh, expert missions. So how do you ensure trust of the country with uh, the staff of the agents or the experts? Because <coughs> this is a security issue. Um, how do we ensure that uh, people on the advisory missions are trustworthy? Maybe, I mean, you found some resistance, some concealment of information because you the uh, Because we go and get them from sources where undoubtedly they're considered trustworthy by their own governments. Um, I, I mean, commonly they come from, from regulatory bodies. I mean, I did a lot, and, and people in the agency would come to me. I was working for a regulatory body in security, they know that. Um, and I think, you know, we assume that, uh, that if their own government considers them to be trustworthy enough to be a regulator in nuclear security or, um, I don't know, nuclear material custodian in a sensitive nuclear facility, you know, they will have been, you know, assured to be trustworthy by, you know. Um, and of course, it's all done through governments anyway. So it's not—they don't go recruiting people off the street. It's—it's it's all done, you know, through government, you know, contacts. So, um, yeah, you're taking an assumption, if you like, that that these people are trustworthy by virtue of where they're employed currently, and that's one of the reasons why, once people leave their job. Um, then they're no longer eligible, you know, because they're not working anymore for, for and as soon as I stop working for government, I stop doing advisory missions, essentially, because they don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> okay. Right. So we will uh, meet here again at 1.30.